Hey, everybody, it's Pete, a turn executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. You know, along the way, I get to meet a lot of interesting people. And one of the people that I'm fascinated by because he's lived such an incredible life is Richard Titus. Richard is uh, an entrepreneur. He's an advisor. He's an investor. He's a movie maker. He is also like recognized by the Queen of England. Uh, just an incredible, incredible dude, musician. He's uh, like the ultimate renaissance man because he's done so many things and done them so well. He has an interesting view of the world and where we're going. And I, I think it's helpful sometimes to check in with these folks who are on the edge of what's possible from their point of view. And, and I know we all learn a lot from that. Richard has been on Popping the Bubble a couple of times. He's the one that got me into investing in uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. You know, basically said, take a small amount of money and just drip it into your account all the time. And that has really honestly has worked. There's a pretty big pile of money there from the fairly small amount of money that I've invested. So uh, I think Richard's really neat. I don't always agree with him with everything, but I definitely appreciate his point of view because he gives me something that I don't get myself. And uh, I just think the world of him. So Richard Titus is our guest today. You can look him up. You'll, you'll find him. He's doing a lot of things. He's got a lot of projects he's working on. He likes companies that start with A, so like ARK Investors and all these other A-based things. Uh, if you see those, that that's his work. You can just type Richard Titus. You'll, you'll find him. Hey, uh, Save the Brave, savethebrave.org. Put a donation in each and every month by just simply clicking on the donation tab, and we will put that money to work helping save veterans' lives, like me. Uh, I mean, I am significantly better off since I started working with Save the Brave. Working in services of others has, in part, saved my life. Also, a lot of therapy and everything else. But it's folks like Save the Brave who put time and effort into veterans. We catch them before they're at the end of the rope. We try to catch them at the end of the rope. But we're trying to build this community where people care about each other, lean on problems together, and solve things like getting a Gold Star family memorial built at the Riverside National Cemetery. You know, this is these are the things that matter and, and give you something to contribute to. So when you see me raising money, it's raising money for these kind of things where we think, hey, this person, we got a veteran who's uh, got terminal cancer and has a mortgage and we're desperate to pay that mortgage off so that he knows that when he dies, his family doesn't have to have a mortgage over their head. We can do that. We can all put enough money together to support that guy. So whatever it is that you're going to do, if you want to build an event with me, hey, Pete, come out to Wyoming and come to Cheyenne because we're going to build an event. We have a band. We're going to go raise. We're going to raise $5,000 and then we'll try to find someone to double that. Okay, great. Let's do that. It doesn't have to be $5,000. It can be $200, whatever it is. Let's work on it together. If your, if your organization does an annual charitable foundation donation, heck, save the brave. Super easy. All right, enough about that. Support the Break It Down Show. Breakitdownshow.com. Go to the PayPal link. It's in the top of the page. And just put some money in there each month. That puts me on the road. If you're going to bet on anyone, why wouldn't you bet on me, right? I don't need Patreon. I need you. Buy me a sandwich. Buy me a beer. Don't have to do that anymore. Just put money in my account each month. I will put that money to work. Equipment, gas, me on the road. This is not for me to get wealthy on. It's for me to go out and build things together with you all. I'm just going to work my heart out. If you believe in that, if you can believe in that bet, grab that PayPal link. Get it from me if you don't have it. Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. I'll text it to you. I'll email it to you, whatever you need. And that little bit of money each month is going to go a long way in putting me on the road. If I just have just a few more people, it's just like that's an ad. That's another ad. That's a long, longer ad. That's a higher ranked ad. All of these things go into investing into the show. All right. Now, without further ado. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Cope. This is Mitchell Epp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Say, this is Richard Titus. You're watching the Break It Down Show. This is Richard Titus, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, we're making it happen, man. This is exciting. We've not chatted for a while, but uh, way back when you did an episode of Popping the Bubble with Sandra Ponce de Leon and I, and we were talking about crypto the last time it blew up and got up around 18,000 points. And it's <laughs> yeah. almost like a joke. Everyone wishes they bought at 18,000. <laughs> it's crazy. You gave me advice that you said, here's how you deal with crypto is, you know, obviously buy what you can afford to lose, stay small and stay persistent. And I've followed that advice. And I've over those couple of years since we've talked, I've built up a, and I didn't start with much money. We're talking 50 bucks at a time, 50 bucks at a time. And, but and there's, now you're damn, bigger than mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's there's about ten thousand dollars sitting there because you know almost everything correlates well with Bitcoin and as it's ramped up, you yeah. know, 
that there's a little pile of money. It's a little pile of money, but there's a little pile of money. What are your thoughts with all of this craziness with crypto? So, I mean, <laughs> I have a million thoughts. So the first thing is, is I always want to distinguish between the asset class of digital securities, um, digital gold, which is what I think of Bitcoin uh, primarily, and then the programming tool of the blockchain, which is, you know, it, it's essentially a, a distributed database and a bunch of other security layer stuff. And as an asset class, all of those things are one asset class, right? And so I think that what we're seeing is a combination of the asset class maturing of sort of people realizing the blockchain is actually here to stay and it's something useful, combined with some sort of macroeconomic changes which are pretty serious, like are, are, are pretty serious and are, are fundamental to our financial system. And what I mean is like, you know, there's half a dollar in the world in the last year. Um, we have a global pandemic and our financial systems are not really prepared for the kinds of changes we've had to face in those last time. And then third, and I think this is most importantly, is we have a lot of political insecurity, not just uh, outside the U.S., but now inside the U.S., which is a new thing for us, I think, or at least a new thing for my generation. There's different kinds of uh, crypto cryptographic currencies we might know of. Bitcoin is like you know the Kleenex of that world, but there's also um, you know Ethereum, which right. to me, the way I understand it, and I definitely want you to correct me if I'm wrong because I'm just kind of going with my understanding is that it's sort of become like the base currency. A lot of things are built off of it, and things branch off of that, and so you can hold Ethereum and gain a lot of value because there's all these subsystems that are dependent upon Ethereum's existence. And so it right. also goes up because it's a, it's its own sort of gold standard. Is that a good way to look at it? Well, at the end of the day, I mean, Bitcoin was first. Right? It's sort of, it, it, it has some very uh, unique properties. One is that there's only 21 million. And, and so it's, a, it's an ever more scarce asset, especially since a lot of people like me have lost large chunks of our holdings over the years through, you know, ineptitude or frankly, not taking it that seriously. Um, I think the rise in Ethereum prices is both people going into the asset class and not knowing and just buying a cheaper, you know, like, oh, Ethereum is cheaper than Bitcoin. But I also think there's a bunch of things working on the Ethereum network uh, and, and the Algorand network and lots of the other networks. And so, you know, you have a market where you've got demand from people who are using it on a day-to-day -day basis for their business. And then you've got a demand of speculators and investors and, and the conjoining of those is, I think, partly why you see all, all sort of crypto assets not uniformly rising, but sort of in general, the rising tide is lifting about. Um, but I also think that people have fundamentally suddenly understood that digital currency, digital money, if you will, is an important thing. And that actually, for instance, the US dollar is not currently fit for purpose for a lot of digital transactions. And, and it doesn't mean they won't be priced in dollars. It just means, you know, I don't know about you, but it, with the pandemic here, uh, and I'm now I've moved to Southern California, so I'm living in Encinitas near the ocean. I get up every morning and get coffee and a bagel or whatever, and I walk down on Encinitas Boulevard and nobody takes cash. Like there's no cash registers, there's no cash. It's all digital right now, it's credit cards. But credit cards are kind of interesting because you're paying a fee for that privilege. And as people start to understand that friction, they may seek other alternatives or more anonymous alternatives or ones that don't don't require giving up your data for the sort of the digital access to your money. And, and those are sort of some of the things that are happening right now. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. The dollar basically is a digital currency right now. It's just not a very efficient one. I mean, because I never have cash. And what I do, it's, it's. I don't know anybody that carries more than, say, $35 in cash at so, any so point in time. Right. Both, I've not seen a coin purse in decades. So there are lots and lots of transactions denominated in U.S. dollars, which is one of the reasons why the dollar is so strong as an economic currency. But... There is no digital dollar in, a, in that somewhere, there's somewhere, somewhere, somehow there's a dollar that's in a bank account representing that dollar, right? And also having things priced in dollars creates a bunch of government and social political implications that I think many people until the last few years weren't really aware of and didn't care. But now I think people are more aware of those things and care more about them. For instance, a few years ago, there was a very famous case where a company was doing business outside the U.S. and there was a transaction involving some technology transfer. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just saying what happened. And the company did a, a transaction where they bought some technology and that technology ended up in a, in a what we'll say is a, a, non, a nation state who's not on the good list, right? 
And the U.S. government prosecuted this company. And the company is like, hey, what the hell are you about? It's a, you know, we Singapore bank, you know, these two countries, none of which is on the protected list. Like, why are you finding us? And they said, yeah, you did the, you did the transaction in dollars. So it's, it's under U.S. law. And actually, it turns out they won the case. It is absolutely right. It was under U.S. law. Um, now, I don't, I don't have any plans of transferring technology to any, you know, rogue nation states anytime soon. It's, but, but it's, you know, just like boats pick a country to fly the flag of and people, you know, have a jurisdiction where they live in. That's the same with money. Like you, you start to wonder, like, well, hey, wait a minute, like what decisions am I making by using a U.S. dollar that I may or may not want to do? And, and interestingly, right now. The comptroller of the currency, whose former Coinbase, has been doing a lot to, I think, push the U.S. in the direction of embracing this innovation versus just trying to push it down and keep the old system. Because, frankly, that old system is less secure, more prone to abuse, and really rewards bad behavior in ways that the new one doesn't. I mean, for instance, um, and I always talk about this, is like criminal activity. Using Bitcoin for criminal activity has got to be the dumb, foolish thing you'll ever do. I have a cousin who's an asset forfeiture for one of the police departments, and he's like, please use Bitcoin. <laughs> please, if you're going to be a drug dealer, please use Bitcoin. Because we can see the transfers. We see the money moving around. If you're using ba you know, baskets or you know, uh, Louis Vuitton bags full of cash, he's like, we have no idea where that money came from or who it is, whose it is. or who, Even if it's in your apartment, you could say it's not yours. He's, so interestingly, Digital currency is actually more traceable. It's safer in many ways, and, and and it's transparent, but also it's more secure, right? There are and now the one thing it's not so secure is you don't have, and this is being changed right now. A bunch of banks have been licensed to hold digital assets and be custodians. You don't have that thing where banks can hold your money and give you an insurance contract that they won't go out of business and that they won't lose your money, right? And people think that that's some magical thing. No, it's just, an, it's just a contract like any other. You can do this in software. And so the big principle to think about and the big change between digital money and physical money is that digital money is programmable, right? So I can write software to grant you money, to take it back or have you pay me back if you don't do certain things. I can verify the transaction, where the money came from, proof of funds. I can do all these things that in today's world are multi-billion dollar businesses a lot of those businesses are going to disappear and be replaced with software. Um, and as uh, as Mark used to say from Andreessen Horowitz, you know, software eats the world, and and it's just got to finance now, and and the gobbling is fascinating to watch. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, aspect of it because there are so many exchanges, you know, and the the the, the increased ability of a cryptographic or a a blockchain technology to exchange value in in a more diverse mm -hmm. way you know like uh, one of the example i always use is we're really bad at valuing what a mother who stays with kids is like you know you get divorced yeah, and it's like, well what's that yeah she didn't work you know it's like well you know my, actually... my friend andrew yang this is actually one of his themes that i really andrew i met him when he was running for president i thought he was a crazy person and now he's running for mayor of new york and i totally support that move i think he'll be a phenomenal mayor um but andrew says like look what's the value of raising great children that's a, that's actually a pretty high value task and right now we value right. at, like, right. like like if you have a couple you know, male, female, whoever that have children and are raising them. And one of them is mostly stay at home raising the children. One is earning money and are working. We value those things only from the respect of financial, uh, financial contribution to society. When in fact, back in the stone ages, there was a guy, maybe like me, who would run around with a spear and hunt, you know, hunt something. And then you had people who were home, you know, growing things in the ground. You had other people who were raising children. And there was a much more equitable division of both labor and a respect for the contributions to society. And somehow we got off the rails around the Industrial Revolution and we never really made it back. Yeah. You know, until then, I think we still respected some of those other contributions, but we no longer respect them in the same way. And, and I actually think that's a problem and needs to be fixed. And you can do it with government, you can do it with society, but it does, at the end of the day, it comes down to people recognizing that there are non-monetary contributions. And my ex-wife, by the way, is laughing right now because I... <laughs> I have changed my view on this. I've really come to understand that there are a lot of different ways of contributing to society and we need to change the way we measure those contributions and reward those contributions. You know, yeah. maybe if you have great kids, you should get a you should get a bigger pension. Right? Yeah, That's an interesting that, thing. Yeah. If, your kids, if your kids don't commit any criminal acts, your pension's doubled. Yeah. Yeah. If your kids get in a higher tax bracket, you go down, you know. 
I can guarantee you, if you lost half your pension, if your kids are arrested, and if you got double your pension, if they didn't, you could, you know, using taxation, transform the way that people raise their children and the way people view responsibility. And, and it's such a simple thing, right? Yeah. I, I, my kids will never be arrested, but if they, if they were and, it would, and they hit my pension, believe me, it would never happen. Yeah. Well, and also maybe we would legislate down some of our uh, passion for consuming people up into prison. You know I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's we arrest Look, a lot I, of people. I, I'm a huge proponent of prison reform, um, yeah. mostly because, and it's funny, I don't even, I don't really smoke weed. Um, I was never really into it. But the, the idea that so many people are in prison for doing something that everyone who was a sort of teenager or a young adult in the 1960s did is crazy. Like, it's just crazy. Yeah. 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 I don't want to get distracted by that conversation, but yeah, we hold 5% yeah. of the world's population. And over a quarter yeah. of the imprisoned people, and you know, and, I mean, whole nations run on no penal system at all. It's all civil. But let's let me, well, let me get back. Well, to, yeah. Without going distracted, here's the one thing I want to say: is we you have to measure things on macro inputs and outputs. And so we had this war on drugs, and I grew up, and you grew up in the war on drugs. And there's a period of time, we'll call it ten or twenty years, where we really, really got heavy handed. And what did that do to consumption? Nothing. There was no change in behavior. There was no. No statistics can show me that this had any effect whatsoever on supply, demand, or, or consumption. Therefore, it's a failed policy. Tear it out and put in something new. And this is as a society, where we come back to crypto, what we're really missing is these macro checks and balances. You know, I was talking to someone the other day about constitutional, constitu or constitutional conventions, and I was like, we should have a mandatory one every 10 years because there are no places where we go, hey, are we on the right track? Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah, also really we, we bad just keep at moving forward. Yeah, if we just keep going forward and making a Frankenstein version of what we weren't happy with the session before, you know, like we just keep yeah. adding things on. Well, it, we are it, literally a manifestation of just in time software development. You know, there was this whole movement for a few years of like, you know, take input, fix, iterate. And as a designer, we hated this because a lot of our work was this like waterfall work. Where we did a lot of thinking and process and we built something. Um, but coming, uh, thinking about life, I think there's actually a blending of these approaches is the right way to do everything, right? And so we don't, we're missing currently a massive waterfall process in governance and societal evaluation. We could say the election is one, but frankly, we've just morphed that into another iterative, very short term thing. And we need some of these longer time frame cadences where big decisions can be made and big shifts can happen and are expected to happen. And we don't currently have that. And I think it's a, I think it's a gap in our society and something we need to fix. Yeah. Gosh, there's so many ways to go from here, but I'm going to go back to the crypto side because uh, yeah, th th there's an important question I want to ask because of our current divide and because the dollar is a backbone uh, currency throughout the world. You know, you have to look at something like Bitcoin or, or alternate currencies if you're another country and say, hey, I'm not going to bet on the long term stability of the dollar. Here. You know, like, let's at least hedge and and go this Bitcoin route or look into, you know, like, how, like I can see a, a place where, look, okay, again, taking our current divide and everything, there is a possibility greater than zero that this nation will not have the same number of states in, say, 10 years. You know, that number, I don't know what that number yeah. is. And yeah. I'm not pushing for anything. Yeah. I'm just saying. That number is greater than zero. So let's say that Texas yeah. and California, New York, all want to go in their own separate way and be the foundation of a new, a new, a new nation. Well, they would be smart to start to create some kind of cryptographic program, you know, so that they have a yeah. currency that they can get away from the dollar effectively and not have things bound up in banks and you know, all of those kind of legal ramifications. So it seems like if you're a fledgling state or a state that requires the dollar to be stable, or you're trying to become a fledgling state, that yeah. There's a possible solution using software as money. Well, and you know, I, I don't want to talk too much. So I am a, as I'm sure you, you're aware, uh, I'm what's called a, a foundation board member. So um, an organization I'm involved in, the Creative Instruction Lab, is is this amazing program started in University of Canada, but it's all over the world now. University of Toronto in Canada, and it's focused on the development of of deep technology companies. Um, uh, and helping founders run through a sort of disciplines. It's a bit like an accelerator, like a discipline set of steps to the build. And so in the worlds of AI, uh, robotics, quantum computing, we're market leading. And we started doing a few years ago, 
probably partly because I made them, uh, doing a blockchain stream. And from that, we were invited to join what was then called the Libra Association. It's now called the DM Association. Um, and so I am their representative on that board. And the DM and AKA Libra really began as an organization that was thinking about in financial inclusion. And one of the things people forget is, you know, forget the West. We have plenty, as my brother-in-law who's in real estate said, look, buying million dollar houses or $10 million houses for him, it's just easy, right? He's got a bunch of people who do things. They all take their small piece. The pieces all move around. It's very smooth. But if you want to wire money and you're in, say, Cartagena, I have some friends who are doing real estate in uh, Cartagena, a wire transfer to Colombia is an unknown it's an unknown amount of time between the time you send it and the time it arrives and and I don't, i'm not saying it's actually corrupt it or even incompetent it's just there's a lot of steps that people are unaware of here in the west because we are primary banking right the other thing that's really interesting is if you are transacting in really small amounts of money in many of those countries the cost of transfer is higher than the value of the, the money being transferred right so um what happens when you have digital currency is you eliminate the cost structure. And so you can actually have value created. And like places like Africa, they started using, you know, mobile minutes. You've seen some things in Latin America where people are using um, um, some other uh, sort of digital currencies that are manifest in other ways. But I think having a single or a set of digital currencies that are stable coins that are backed by real fiat dollars, but allow on ramps and off ramps and, and having it done at scale is actually going to really change the state of the world and bring work to people who didn't have access to that work and bring opportunity to those people. Um, and, and by the way, there may, you know, the other side of the balance is it may move some work out of Silicon Valley, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's just change. It's just, the, it's just the, the constant evolution of change. Going back to this sort of this political divide and trying to figure out how to solve that. I mm -hmm. often wonder if we're, uh, if we're post Congress, because they sure as hell can uh, impeach a president on a dime. But if it's hard stuff like medical care or getting help to people who need help, you know, these other things, declaring war when we go to war, they sure as hell drag their feet and like don't get involved in solutions. So maybe we're post Congress, yeah. but could we build a software uh, exchange value exchange system that was incentivizing participation through the government? Because, you know, frankly, I just don't trust it. And, and I don't think anybody could blame me. We've seen the FBI fail to, you know, convict people who can't control classified we've seen yeah. spies and we've seen so many problems where you're like i don't trust the cia i don't trust the fbi yeah i clear nobody nobody likes congress in general i mean their ratings have been in the garbage we can't seem to elect a president that we're in any way as a nation excited about it's a lot of mistrust i don't want those people handling important things can we find a way to incentivize good people to go do these work on these problems and participate well i'm going to say something you probably uh <laughs> that we might disagree with, which is, uh, so I have a lot of relatives in law enforcement. Um, I have a lot of friends who are in the security apparatuses. And I think that often, um, often we've sort of given negative, it, it's like the tip of the, the iceberg, you know, we see this part and there may be some incompetence or stuff, but what you're missing sure. is all this stuff down here where there's a lot of really good work happening. Um, and I'm going to use a case in point um, is the solar winds hack, right? So the solar winds hack, is an action by a state player. Uh, I'm not going to say who, although I'm pretty sure I know. And that state player spent a long time to sort of get inside a piece of software that's used by lots and lots of network uh, security professionals all over the world, but predominantly government, but lots of other people too. And they, they this was a this was a criminal and frankly maybe even act of war that happened, right? And it happened, but once it happened, Krebs, who was still uh, in, in the federal government at the time, the, the, the pieces he'd put in place worked quickly to shut that down. And had we not had that apparatus, you know, you would still be seeing people losing millions of dollars, data. I mean, the hack is bad, but like there's a lot of good work that's happening. And I think much of what I think is a society we need to really confront is how much innovation are we comfortable with and how do we prevent existing industry society players from restraining innovation which is insurgent to their marketplace you know in the financial world it's easy to give an example like investment bankers hate crypto because the net net of crypto particularly around digital securities if you digitize the securities industry you're going to eliminate tens of thousands of jobs and profits and companies right it won't happen right away but it is an inevitable end just like 
the digitization of the you know the media business, particularly newspapers, eliminated all the printing presses over time. There's still some around, but they're not nearly. You know, we don't use paper now. Some might say that's a good thing, but if you were a printing press guy, it was a pretty bad thing actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think it's really important not to restrain innovation, but to set up incentives and structures that drive that innovation in positive ways. Right. So. Um, you know, people talk about Tesla surviving on tax breaks. Yeah, but like, look what happened. We built a multi-billion dollar business that's made the world a better place, arguably. And I think more Tesla and, and you know, less alternatives, right? Like those, I want to see more government spending on helping do like, like the work we do at Creative Destruction Lab, like really helping young founders take that risk and start new companies with new ideas and new thinking. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that is exciting. And plus, you also want to free up Elon Musk to think up the next thing, whether he's boring holes under LA or going to so Mars, I, you know? I am so, I, I was a, I was allowed to invest in, in, in Tesla pre-IPO, and, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. And I've always been a fan of his. I've never bet against him. Um, in fact, whenever people sort of hate on Elon, I'm like, look, you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses as human beings, but this is a, a person who is singularly, unique in his ability to transform the world and i want more lines not less and i want him to be able to do the great work he's doing and i think in many ways if you look at sort of and i don't want to get in trouble with, with any of the three-letter agencies but there was a lot of activity around him around those three-letter agencies and when you look back on that history being hindsight being 2020 you realize that that was a tempest in a teapot and really didn't matter like it actually didn't matter and so all of that was really about him distorting, him playing with people who are using financial instruments to affect the, the success of his business. You know, sh short sellers and people playing games with the markets. And I think, and then some of it is because he talked when he shouldn't have or didn't follow the rules. But, you know, I think one of the big questions there was, were the rules the right rules or should the rules be changed? And I think as a society, we need that moment of saying, hey, are these the... He broke the rules, fine, but are the rules correct? Should there be a different set of rules or should we reevaluate that rules on that like larger, longer cadence? Right? And as a business, you always do this. You have strat planning or as a founder, you're always thinking about how to make my business successful. But I think as a government, we have no incentives other than the four-year cadence to really think about longer term problems and longer term things. And I actually think that that's something that as a society we do. Eric, the guy who uh, who built a lot of the thinking in Silicon Valley to make things more responsive to user feedback is actually doing something with long-term stock exchange, where it's asset classes that have longer time horizons than one year, five years, eight years. And I think that's it. I just think longer-term thinking is something as a society we need to embrace and extend more. Yeah, because we definitely careen right, left, right, left. This this conflict, that conflict, our existential we rotate our existential crises, you know, like constantly and it doesn't make for good progress uh, yeah for example right. we have the ability to create a state-of-the-art medical care system but you can't get anybody in line to say i'm willing to give up everything to get this state-of-the-art thing you know we all want to actually uh, yeah i'll give you a great example of this my Please. mom is over 65 and wants to get a vaccine right um and i actually have pre-existing conditions but i'm in my 50s right so the thing is we're in California for the first few weeks, we threw away a bunch of vaccines because we couldn't, didn't have anyone to give them to. And yeah. there were people I know, and I'm not going to name any names, who were at medical facilities that had this vaccine that was being destroyed. And they said, look, just give it to me. And they were like, you know, you're from a first principles, that is exactly the right choice. Legally, it is illegal and impossible for us to do this. Right. And so, and I started poking at this with a couple of friends of mine in public health. And I was like, why is it impossible? And they said, well, here's the thing. If you allow the hospital's discretion, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a VIP line in the back of the hospital. <laughs> and like people are making donations to the foundation to get the prescription early and it was going to go bad anyways. And he's like, yeah. so you have to, all of this balancing has to happen. But, you know, I really do think we have to trust our medical system and we have to have a system that's goal. The goal of the medical system is to inoculate as many people as possible, not to follow the rules. Like the rules are there to affect the end, not the end. Right. <laughs> And this is the thing as a society we often forget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this, and, I, I mean, I mean, I'll, honestly, I'll talk about the election because it's the elephant in the room. The election is interesting to me. So, I, 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 it's very obvious who I voted for. Um, it's you know very public. But 
my friends who voted for the other side is I, I said to them, look, maybe there is maybe there is bad voting. Maybe there wasn't. I, I don't think there was, but I don't actually think it matters because there's no there was no change in bad voting that was different from the election four years before that or the one four years before that. And the fact is, as a society, our goal is to make voting more secure every time. And so we achieve that goal this time and we should work to achieve it next time. And so if you think there's bad voting, do what Stacey Abrams does is roll up your sleeves and dig into the process and help make the process more effective and more and more and more correct, if that's what you believe. But as a society, that's the way our American our American government and democracy really has to work is that you're constantly improving and iterating and evolving it with a long term goal. And otherwise, we're going to be just like, uh, you know, ancient societies where you had, you know, a war every couple of hundred years and thousands of people would die and, you know, the governments would fall and rise. And, and, and there wasn't a lot of innovation during those times. You know, all the best innovation, if you think about it, happened during the long periods of peace, like the Roman Empire, or the British Empire, not that they were good, but they affected long periods of peace, which allowed innovation to thrive. Can you have a secure election if you have a compromised press corps? That's a really interesting. So first off, I don't actually believe part of the problem is, is we've put a box around a group of people who work for mostly legacy media businesses, many of which I used to run and said, those are the press. <laughs> and, and the, but, and, and okay, great. Except that actually, I don't know about you, but I get most of my information from a whole variety of sources of which those people are probably 30, 40%. They're definitely not 80%. And those other people, are they press or are they not press? That our definitions aren't very good, right? So these people, for sure, especially some of the people I follow on Twitter, they're either reporters or they're public figures, and some of them are full of shit, and that's fine, right? Like I purposely follow a few people with some extreme views on both sides of the spectrum because I want to have information that maybe might disagree with my fundamental view of the world, but that's a choice I make, and all of those people's free speech should be protected. Now, the question is, should their ability to broadcast on various platforms be protected? And I, I, I don't have good answers for this. I think this is one of the fundamental questions of the 21st century is how do we re-architect free speech and copyright in a world of digital publishing and digital social, digital media, and frankly, social, right? Because yeah. I don't think, you know, we, we, it's just like the money problem. We didn't, the guys who were, you know, 200 years ago, could never have imagined this, right? Just like the people who architected our banking system could never have imagined a situation where money could also be used for something else. You know? right. I mean, <laughs> you know, Ethereum being an example of it's money, but it's also code. Right. right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I want to go back to the question, though, because the specter of, of ill doing or misdeeds is always worse than the actual thing. So let's use the election as, as our proxy for that. Yeah. You know, maybe it's more secure yeah. than uh, tens of millions of people believe. However, because of, of companies like Twitter being compromised and what they allow for reporting and, and CNN and Fox, right? They both have these slogans, you know, like about integrity or balance and nobody believes either of them. Like they're just dismissed yeah. because they have all sold their integrity for ad space and well so, I mean, like, so just called the fair, right your, your viewers should watch could go google something called the fairness doctrine and I, I have some deep concerns that when we change the ownership rules on media companies and the simultaneously change the fairness doctrine i think we didn't think it through all the way and i think that's probably a, a thing we should go back and re-explore uh, everyone has forgotten that it used to be all news was like fair it had to be fair and balanced because the sec or the ftc would actually lose you license and right. remember, the reason those organizations have any restrictions on their ability to broadcast is because they're using public airwaves. And those public airwaves are a public infrastructure, and therefore, they have to have a license to use it. Um, now, I would argue the internet is somewhat similar and different in that the internet is both public and private, right? It was originally built with public dollars, but it has grown way outside the manifestation of where the government could have some influence or control over it. I mean, like if the government shut down the government parts of the internet, it would work just fine. It was designed to do that by Vince Cerf and, and, and the team. And so I think that we, and yet if you shut the internet down, like the world would break right now. Like I was joking with someone, I said, look, 
you could shut down oil production right now and it would suck, but we'd work it out. If you shut down the internet, like society would fall. Think about that for a minute, because that wasn't true even 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, my Tesla, my Tesla, and my solar panels, my, I would still be able to drive around. I, my life really wouldn't change that much without oil. I'd like, I'd have to change my diet. That would be the big change is like, there's not as many vegetables available around here. So I'd have to change some of the things I eat. I wouldn't get as many Amazon deliveries, but you know, it all work itself out. Um, electricity, internet access, like the pyramid of priorities on the, on the Maslow's priorities has shifted somewhat. And I don't think we, as a society, really embraced or understood that just yet. Yeah, that's interesting to think about, especially, and again, going back to Elon Musk, throwing the internet up in this shallow, shallow space. And, you know, what you're able to uh, block is, it's going to be different in 10 years when that thing's, you know, essential to living. And as a neural net, I can't wait to get I can't wait to get Starlink. I cannot wait to get Starlink. First of all, because I only right now have one broadband provider here in Encinitas, it's Cox Cable. And yeah. right now I'm really unhappy with them because <laughs> my service is intermittently bad or good. And, and there's no competition, right? Because they have a license from the government yeah. here to deliver. And they, you know, AT&T kind of abdicated their ability to service these customers at some point. And there's no, like, I was like, well, what if I wanted to start an ISP that's actually cost prohibitive? Right. Right. Yeah, it's funny. The, uh, the the cable product in terms of delivering information to your house is is almost a legacy product now at this point. You know, they're they're trying desperately to create more value in it. And it's like every time they iterate higher, it, it, the service just gets lower. You know, like it's just well, it's just it's funny is we we were in our last house was in this, was Spectrum. And before that, I had something called Monkey Brains in San Francisco, which is point to point microwave. And we didn't even have a cable subscription. And so Spectrum at least had an app. It would sit on the TV and I'd watch some video on that, but it was all video over IP. Cox kind of requires you to have cable boxes if you want to watch any local content. There's no other way to do it. And even in their offerings and the way they communicate, it's very obvious that they view internet as sort of, well, I guess we'll do this. Like they still think they're a television content delivery company. And the internet is kind of like a, a product they have because they have to have it. And they kind of, you know, it's not really... And there isn't anyone else here who delivers who's like, hey, we'll give you sort of fiber to your door um, for this much money. And there's the microwave providers here don't exist like they do in other places. I think partly because cable's good enough, but partly because people haven't, until very recently, we didn't understand how important internet access was, right? I mean, even when I said it to you, the, your first reaction was like, oh, oil is pretty important. It takes a couple of seconds to realize that that balance has teetered just a bit the other way. And I would argue this is true of a lot of things, right? Office space will never recover. Not that we won't go back to work, but we're going to go back to work differently than we ever did before. I will never, my next startup, if I do one, would never consider working from an office the first step. It's just one of the options, right? Yeah, completely. And then the other thing is, is um, let's say that uh, I'm an employee of a company and now I'm working from home. You now have to give me compensation for me handling all the things. It's my house that's being torn apart by my door, my chair sliding back. Like it's, they're going to have yep. to go the other direction. Where now instead of paying some giant building in, in a city, you're going to have to pay these employees an allowance of some kind to to tear their house apart with day to day office activity. You know. Well, so this is really interesting. I was thinking about. I have a much more tactical thing, right? So we just moved. Uh, we moved down here temporarily, and we're borrowing someone's house for a while. And then we actually bought a house, my partner and I. So now we're living here full time, at least for now. Um, and right, the future is murky. We don't know. It depends on lots of things and COVID and things like that. But what's fascinating is, is getting our house set up. I was like, I, I want a geek squad that's not tied to Best Buy. Not that Best Buy is there's anything wrong with Best Buy. But I want to like have a service that I can call and pay an hourly fee to come fix shit, you know. Uh -huh. And that could be like help me set up the firewall rules on my router, or it could be, hey, my daughter's Wi-Fi is slow because there's lots of people with Wi-Fi around here. Can you help us fix this? You know, like there isn't a service for that really, and there really should be, you know. Mm -hmm. And someone said, well, why don't you start it? And I was like, God, I always swore I wasn't ever going to do a service business again. <laughs> but it, it is sort of a thing. Like there's a real business there, you know, and I think people would pay a reasonable sum of money to have a one-stop shop that did everything from set up your Sonos speakers, get your printer working, and companies could pay a subscription for you to have access to that service. All right. So here I'm going to pitch you an idea that I have. Not a specific idea, but it's a marketplace. And I'm going to use a word here that's going to take a second to explain, but it's the re-disintermediation 
platform of apps. So like when um, whatever Uber, they're like, you can tip, and they take a piece of it. You know, whoever it is, these companies that try to insert themselves into a, an exchange, you know, like TaskRabbit was bad at this. You know, uh, it's all of these companies that are gig, gig companies or people that work from tips, you could just have an app called Tips. And then we're going to take a point multi zero one or whatever percentage of each transaction because we want you to tip people and we don't want somebody getting in between you and your money. And so you can re disintermediate <laughs> these companies that want to insert smiling. I've been pitched this idea in varying forms for years. So a guy pitched me this a couple of years ago for artists, like musicians, and his thing was like the virtual tip tar. Um, I think there are people already doing this. I have a friend, Cyan, who has a, she's got a like newsletter and a podcast and used to be able to like donate it to her to sort of support the efforts. Um, it, it definitely exists. I mean, I would argue only fans is a form of this in a way, but we, most of those people eventually just like all service businesses really try and push themselves into a subscription model because it's, it's much more profitable yeah. and, and you don't have collection risk. Right. Um, and, I, this is the thing I've been thinking about a lot is like how we have a lot of people who are going to be unemployed or are unemployed. And many of those people may not be able to go back doing the work they were doing before. And I want to reemploy them doing something that benefits society. And so one of your points earlier about, uh, uh, about basic income, I, I totally agree with. I mean, I think that everyone should have some sort of value measured by your contribution to society, many of which may not be work in the old way of thinking about it. But I also think like we've got a bunch of failing infrastructure. As a society, we should think about how to collectively incentivize people to work towards those things, right? Like, so, you know, I was reading in my community, it was not my city, but one of the communities here was bitching about like the roads are, you know, roads are cracked, whatever, you know, we don't have any money to fix them. And I'm like, well, like, I'm sure you could raise that small meager amount of money from this community if there was a simple not frictionless way for me to just make sure the money went to that. Like, but I don't want to put five hundred dollars a year towards extra taxes and know that three hundred of those dollars are going to pay for things I do not. I want new roads. I want. Well, I want broadband. I do not want, you know, Joe Blow's politician's friend getting, you know, some party license. You know, in San Francisco, we have a, there's a bunch of corruption up there. Like, I, I don't want like free parties for city city employees paid for by my three hundred dollars. You know, I want it to go only to roads, and so. I do think that we're going to see some shifts. What digital currencies will do will allow the transparency of seeing where money is going, and we'll tra- start to trim some of the waste and some of the some of the frankly the bad bad actors. And you will be able to pool money towards things that you couldn't in ways you couldn't do before because the the collection of that money and the there will be no way to obfuscate its purpose and its use, and that will that will be really powerful. But it's not currently the way, but it is the way of the future. Yeah, I think this is a great point because one of the problems when we have mistrust of of the government is if you have a memory, you know, we all agree on measure F and that's going to fund this thing. And then the legislators are like, hey, that's great. All this, like the state lottery in California is a great example. When they had the California state lottery first started, it was going to make our schools state of the art and it was going to change everything. And then they instantly reallocated the budget money for schools away because it was now covered by the lottery. And it's like, and then they, and they always run on more money for more schools. And then they needed, and then the majority of that money went to pay for pensions, if I remember, because yeah, there was actually yeah, the pension fund. Like, oh, yeah. We have to do better at this accounting. Like, no, 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 that money is already earmarked, you know, for this thing. There's no, there's no going back and changing the rules because, you know. This is, like, this is an interesting thing. Rachel Maddow did this show last week, which I really, really enjoyed, where she talked about Michigan and Flint, and Flint, Michigan, and the, the girl now being prosecuted. And I actually never, I, you know, I'm very familiar with sort of the tactics of that case. But what I had not understood was that the governor of Michigan, who was a Republican, had put in place a system that allowed emergency managers to be appointed to public service organizations. And, and by the way, I, I read through the sort of framework of what this was when it was first, it was first like launched. And it actually made sense. Like, I, I, I'm going to give two sides to this so you kind of get where I'm coming from. In the city of San Francisco, the head of public works, uh, Mohamed Nuru, is currently indicted and is sitting at home with, their ankle, with that ankle bracelet for taking bribes and being a really, really, really corrupt human being. Um, I'm not saying he is or he isn't. I, I don't have, I, but you know, that's it just looks his current bad. situation, right? It, it yeah. looks pretty bad. Like he, he took donations, someone gave him a tractor. Like, it's like, and 
the thing is, it wasn't like hundreds of millions of dollars. It was tons and tons and tons of five, ten, twenty thousand dollars shenanigans, right? But the incomp- what would happen is no mayor of San Francisco ever drove down a street that was dirty because Mohammed made sure it was clean, right? So from an employee evaluation standpoint, he's doing a makeup job. And in many ways, if you were certain people in the city, you thought he was great, right? Yes. <laughs> and so that, and then in Flint, Michigan, we, if I don't know the whole story, but I'm guessing that there was a lot of problems with water planning, water management, costs, lots of overruns. And so there may have been benevolent reasons to begin with to sort of fix this. The problem is there was no accountability when the fix wasn't what didn't work they eliminated yeah. the feedback loop right because the feedback loop was was really loud negative negative. Um, and so they'd say well it's just like let's just get you know hey those people are complaining a lot let's take them out of the loop and let, let's just take the legislators and the public representatives out of the system and then, then no more complaints right yeah <laughs> and, and instead of replacing it with a checks and balances system and so i think as a society we have these checks and balances and they the friction of them can often wear on us but i think it's actually critical as leaders and as a society to have checks and balances to make sure we're doing the right thing and help us, you know, fix it when we're not. So in San Francisco right now, there's a bunch of people being arrested and and some of them will eventually go to prison for a level of corruption, which is just astonishing, right? But it'll take 10 years. But at the end of that 10 years, San Francisco is going to be an amazing place to live, right? In the meantime, it's pretty rough. Yeah, well, you know, that's how these systems go when they just absorb power and money. It gets hard to give away that power and that money, you know, and that's that's why we have these things like we're going to call this herd now. The, one of the things I, was, I know someone who works in a very, very, very liberal city and mm-hmm. they work in a part of the city that has uh, that covers projects. We'll say building projects. And this, this not exactly this, but just yeah. for our conversation, building projects. Yeah. And they've worked in this this role for, for decades. And so they know the people that can build things in town. However, there's always a competition mm-hmm. on who gets allowed to build certain things. Right. And what this person realized was that just because you're new at this and you deserve a shot doesn't mean that you're capable of doing it. And even though you come in low, you've probably underbid. And because you're not as good at the job as company A, um, it's going to cost the city even more money. So I'm going to continue to give the business to company A, which right. in their eyes is corruption. And in his eyes or her eyes, it's like, hey, this is a this is the better path for taxpayer money. We're using taxpayer money for this project. Therefore, like you've got to be qualified to do this specific kind of work. And then you get in trouble because you're trying to save taxpayer money. Uh, so here's the thing I think. So first off, I think saving money, spending money is the wrong measure of success there. And it's an interesting thing, right? Because the measure of success is actually did the project get done and are people satisfied with the result, right? But we don't measure those things. That's not actually how, and, and I'll give you a great example of this, is, is homeless services. And I'm going to use San Francisco, which I'm very, I lived there for you know, right. a long time in my life. Um, homeless service is an amazing, I, I spent a, some time last year really thinking, I didn't do a lot. I spent a lot of time thinking and talking to people who are very knowledgeable about the homeless problem because there's a lot of homelessness in San Francisco. I, I, I'm a recovering addict. And so I have a, a history with some of the causes of you know mental illness, addiction, that cause homelessness. And I thought, you know, like, I'm a smart guy. I got some free time thanks to COVID. I'm going to think about this. And it turns out that one of the biggest reasons that the problem doesn't get solved is that the measurement of success for much of the effort to solve homelessness, and this is not just in San Francisco, the measurement is on people served, right? So if you're an organization that serves the homeless, they're your customers, right? Right. You want to make them really happy, and you, but you don't want them to not be homeless because then you lose your customers. Right. So, of course, you're not going to do anything to solve homelessness. You're going to do something that allows those homeless people to come and get served by you. Because that's your measure. Yes. Right. So actually, and the problem is, if you measure getting people off the streets, well, you're just going to stop counting. Right. Because the, like, the problem is, is that the people in the various points of the pipeline, nobody owns the customer beginning to end. So nobody is measured on that total cadence. Right. And so. Like, it's a big problem. It's actually when you really step back, you go, wow, I don't actually know how I would do this, right? Because what I'd have to do is have someone's social security or some identification feature. Um, and I'd have to have that and know for their whole life cycle, how long do they stay off the streets? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
this is uh this goes right into the prison reform thing and again the exchange of value so we have a prison industrial complex because we crave primarily young black men and want to put them in prison look down upon them when they fail so if we were going to fix this one if we were going to incarcerate less people handle more of this externally and i'm not talking about letting dangerous felons run the streets everybody calm down we're talking about you know people that don't need to be in prison not in prison and being case managed in some way to get them out of their problem but this is a thing we're like okay you know if you can provide to the the, the, the client the prisoner you know an aa a ba any of these things we're going to quickly get to these different variates in the multivariate equation that society gives us and you're going to say we've satisfied all of these things i can't give you a dad but i can't give you a mentor you know, I can, you know, yeah. I can get you educated. Yeah. Yeah. I can get you yeah. into journeyman status. I can also get you past the age 32 where most everybody's going to chill the F out and probably not go yeah. to prison, you know? And then now we have yeah. something that's useful and also get off everybody's necks when they come out of jail. Like we have to say, you've done your part. Well, now it's try funny, be right? Like I, this is like, so I think one of the best tools of prison reform is giving prisoners the right to vote once they've, they've done their time right because right now and this is i mean you know thinking about the political arrest the last few weeks all of those people who are in the capital are going to be convicted felons they're going to lose the right to firearms and they're going to lose the right to vote so i can't think of a bigger group of people who are more riled up to vote in a certain way they're, they're gone they're out of the system right they're going to get convicted we have them on video in the capitol building that's a felony done so in a way, this will probably long term help solve the problem because people, politicians are going to start to realize like this is this is great. Like we should once these people do their time, they pay the penalty, they do what society has decided is the thing. They're going to come out and they come back into society in some way. Um, now, does this mean if you're uh, a convicted child molester, you should be a school teacher? No, <laughs> no. But, you know, just like if you're a bank robber, you probably shouldn't work for a bank unless it's in thought for, uh, uh, theft prevention, right? But but it does mean you shouldn't have to sit at home in a halfway house for the next 20 years because you can't get a job because you did this thing at a point in your life. And then you've changed and you've evolved and you come back. So I think, you know, Sweden is one of my favorite places where the prison system has a really, really good efficacy rate of getting people out. Drugs are a little harder because drug addiction, it's, it's both disease and behavioral and, and yeah. also mental illness. Right. So and we don't really deal with that very well as a society we in do general not. in America. Right. So but long term, that's our future is going to be really good. Like in long term, I, I feel like we've turned a corner there and we as a society recognize the mental illness is an illness. And so it'll take time. But I feel confident that we're on the right path. You know, it's just I want to see us do it faster. That's the thing I care very much about. One of the advantages that places that do prison well, or or even you know like the program they do in Switzerland, where they literally give out heroin to people who are addicted to heroin. Granted, there are some governmental incentives to do act in a certain way, but they literally give heroin out, and they reliably get people off of it. Not everybody, but they get people off. Is these yeah. places are very homogenous in terms of ethnicity? Are we too diverse to be able to be a more socialist kind of place where we just. <laughs> so I've heard tear. this. I always hear this, right? It always cracks me up because when people give this argument, they talk about Sweden as being, you know, massively Caucasian. But actually, if you look at drug addicts in Sweden, they're not massively Caucasian because they have a big immigrant population. They were very, very open to immigration because they had uh, people were having as many babies and they had, they needed more taxpayers. So they let a lot of people immigrate in. And actually, uh, criminal activity, and particularly drug addiction, fall heavier there on immigrant populations, which makes a lot of sense. So actually, the, argue, it, it, the, the supposition is actually false. Like, it's actually, you need to look at what is the, the, the socioeconomic breakdown of the people who are in the pool, addicts, criminal, and then look at how that behavior shifts, right? And how that matches in America. And what you find is it's a pretty good match. Like, if you are not, privileged in a system, you start out disadvantaged and it's really hard to get a leg up. And I think in many ways, we should view that as a goal of the system is if the prison system, if you come out and commit a crime, the prison should lose its bonus for a year. I guarantee you this would be solved very, very quickly if we had an incentive system that said, look, of the of your prison, in the last 10 years, you've had a 30% recidivism rate, you get only 60% of bonus instead of 100% of bonus. Oh, you've had 0%. You get some of the extra bonus that we took off the other guys. 
I love it. And then why not just give them all state jobs when they come out? Like you're welcome to transition out, but we know that if you've got a job, you don't recidivate. So let's just give everybody a job with a normal salary. It's funny. The Hoovervilles and, uh, you know, Kentucky Power. So I actually think the next 10 years, I'm a big fan of, of AOC. I'm pretty supportive of, of the movements around the the sunrise movement and thinking about like the green jobs act. I think that's the right way to go. I mean, I think we should expand it to include infrastructure and some other things. And I think that it should be a matter of, to marry that and some of Andrew Yang's thinking around basic income to say, look, if you're contributing to society and here are all the ways you can contribute. And by the way, being a mom is a way, right? Educating children is a way, caring for children is a way, caring for an elder person is a way. Um, you're guaranteed a basic income. And then you can actually expand that by doing contributing more and moving up a ladder. And I think as a society, we would be much better off from a framework like that than the one we're in now, right? The one we're in now incentivizes cheating and incentivizes uh, taking advantage of others for your own benefit versus for the greater societal good. Uh, yeah, there are so many industries you just described. <laughs> You know, yep. like you've, yep. you've been in the music industry. You know how this works. The people who have the best houses aren't famous. You'd never bought one of their albums, but they've made a fuck ton of money on on people. I mean, look, here's a great What's example. Funny about music. Like, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was they, just they, say they, the great thing about music is musicians today, <laughs> like the really great musicians of the last two generations, are better off than the, you know, sort of the middle group of musicians in the last 20 years are better off than the middle group of musicians for our entire lives. Yes. Right. The stars will always be stars. Right. And the bottom is kind of always the same. Like it's that guy who played bass in your band and he's still like dry, living in the same band doing the same thing. But it's the middle market of music is actually transformed with digital. Right. Because this, this, the friction, the systems that slow down their accretion of capital and all the incentives to steal from them are all gone. Yeah. Yeah. I think the point I was going to make earlier is like someone, I'm kind of to your point, this like Sly Stone, we had him on the show and he not only is mad at the people who own the masters and, you know, don't pay out the royalties and fudge his numbers. He's also mad at his own attorneys because they also get paid as he fights for his rights and he ends up having to pay that, you know, and it's just, they suck all his money and he's, he's the genius in the room, no matter where he goes. And thankfully yeah. this has gotten better and you have to have a smaller audience now to make a, a, a comfortable income. But music has had to deal with technology a lot more than a lot of other industries have. Look, I was signed to a label as a young man. And we I probably owe the record label some amount of money still somewhere. There's a contract that says I owe the money. I'm never going to pay it. I have no intention to pay it. I'm sure the statute of limitations is long expired. They're not collecting. You know, I don't even know if that label still exists. But, you know, that is a crazy business model, right? That should have been a non-recourse loan to the entity that was the band. Right. And they should have been like venture capitalists and owned 10, 20 percent of the business max for the first record. Not 80 yeah. percent. Yeah. <laughs> and we're keeping your masters, you know, Jeez, it's crazy. Bad. It's it's actually crazy. And like real estate is the same thing. Like, look at all the like the varying. It's actually a thing I've been working on a little bit lately is like thinking about um, like, look at risk capital and labor contribution for various kinds of industries. My relatives, so my, my partner and her family are all in real estate. And so looking at the real estate piece and then looking at venture capital and then looking at media businesses and looking, it turns out real estate's a pretty good deal. You know, you have 50, 50, you know, people who are doing the project and people who are investing in it. And then you pay them first, the people who put hard cash in, get their cash back and then they get a preferred rate of return. And, you know, it's interesting, right? You take a management fee at the top. Yeah. Venture capital is pretty good for the venture capitalists and pretty good for the investors, because, but only if they're getting the sort of top top tier returns. Um, investment banking and sort of a lot of the sort of more complex derivative instruments aren't very good. And like there's a sliding scale to like, you know, lending money on lending platforms, not very good at all. And what you're seeing in digital is things like DeFi and using using software to begin to build derivative lending products. We're going to start seeing a correct pricing of risk, which is going to really change the market of lending and risk capital forever. I want to talk a little bit about these unstoppable companies. This is not something that I can explain well, mm-hmm. so I'll just tee it up for the audience and then let you smash it out of the park. 
the ability to build a company that basically has no employees. It's software driven. It provides a service. It can be a Pico service, like service to a service to a service. But basically, yeah. once you create it and turn it on, you can walk away and this thing will always be there creating value and, and providing this thing. And, and also cutting someone a, a fractional share of a penny every time someone does it. Well, until someone makes a better one. So right. this is just, I'll, I'll right. Make, right. So this is an interesting. I'm not going to name any names, although I don't know where he is right now, so you might get mad. So there was a guy who worked for us who had worked at the BBC before I got there, and had written a content management system. Uh, I might be too specific. I might get myself in trouble. And he had left the BBC and England and moved to a tax haven somewhere in the in the sort of you know uh, Mediterranean Sea. Um, he wasn't a bad guy. He'd done a really good job building this piece of software. It was, it was quite good. But it was built in such a way that, like, and, you know, BBC, like any organization, has, you know, turnover. And over time, this guy sitting in this tax haven was kind of the best, cheapest option for maintaining this content management system. And over time, as the importance of the system that was built in this content management system grew, and all the people who knew how it worked had left or changed businesses or changed companies or industries, he had a monopoly provide. He was a monopoly provider of services, and so he had a guaranteed income, and it was a pretty great life for a while for him. Yeah. And then I came in, and I was like, I don't, I didn't have anything against this guy, but I was like, first of all, this thing doesn't fit in all the other content management systems we have. I don't want to build it from the ground up, but I want to plug it into what we're doing and denigrate it over time, so that over time it becomes less and less important. And he hated me because I was literally <laughs> cutting off his retirement plan. Right. And so I tell this story not to say he's a good guy or a bad guy. I think he's pretty smart and he wrote great software. I say this because we always tend to assume that things will stay the same when, in fact, the only lesson of history is that they don't stay the same, is that change is constant, right? So perpetuity is non-existent, and change is, but change is, it, it, it changes perpetuous. Yeah, the pace of change, the pace of technology, those things don't agree either. Technology tends to outgrow that, that or change tends to lead to technology, which tends to lead to the next thing. It's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. What, what else do you want to bring up here? We only got a few minutes left. Yeah, that's fine. So I think I, 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 we've covered a lot of the things. One of the things I'm thinking about a lot is is I think, so here we are a year after COVID started. And I think that none of us expect it to be this long. And I still think we're being overly ambitious in how short, how quickly we're going to solve this, even with vaccine. And I also think as a society in America, there's a bunch of fundamental questions that we have not really, we aren't embracing and dealing with. Like one of them we talked about already is copyright or right to free speech. How does free speech work in a digital world? Um, is Facebook a public utility or is it a publishing platform? You know, is it, is it the New York Times? Or is it AT and T? And I actually, I don't have strong opinions about this. I can argue both sides, which which makes me realize that this is something that needs a lot more digging in than what we've done today. I also think, like, who who has the right and duty to evaluate the algorithms of social media platforms for fairness, or for bias, or for corrupting, right? These are all really important questions around sort of free speech and communications. I think in the finance system, it's the same way. Like, if we're going to embrace digital currency, how do we make sure that drug dealers aren't laundering their money or Russian or Russian uh, Russian spies who help you know overthrow the U.S. government are then now using the proceeds of that without being subject to you know restrictions and denigrations? How do we stop bad things from happening in society and punish wrongdoers, but simultaneously? bring those people back in once they're rehabilitated, actually rehabilitate them versus just punish them for doing bad. Like these are all really, it all comes down to balancing incentives and measuring success and measuring failure and being really accountable to one another as a society. And I think that's the last part I'd like to hit is so many of my friends are standing on, on mountains. It's a bit like my parents' divorce. Like they're standing on the mountains with their, with their uh, catapults, lobbing big stones at each other. And nobody's thinking about the fact that we have, you know, two to five weddings to attend together and lots of bar mitzvahs. <laughs> yeah, right. Like the throwing of stones is not going to make that a better experience. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and then the uh, overall lack of uh, tolerance, you know, and it's it's one thing to say that you hate hate, but you've got a circular problem there and that you end up yeah. self-loathing. We've got to, we all can take way more than what we think we can politically and conversationally. I mean, I know you and I don't agree on everything, but but that doesn't mean that we can't have a quality conversation. And and I also don't think, we should, I think we should avoid trying to categorize people, you know, like I'm center right, middle left. I'm going to disagree with you on both sides of you, depending on the topic, you know, and yeah, but I, oddly, I'm probably more conservative than people think because I'm very right. libertarian. Yeah, but I'm very civic duty focused, right? So I think as a libertarian, you opt in to doing more to make your society better. And, and that altruism is something that I was brought up in. And, you know, maybe a function of my upbringing or just to say, you know, the, the culture I was brought up in is you do things because they're the right things to do. They do things because they're hard. Yeah, you don't yeah. do the easy. You don't take the easy path like that. Like who does that, right? And maybe I don't know. Maybe a lot of people weren't raised that way, and we don't have a system for either resetting that or or feeding back to you that change is possible and that change is warranted and will be rewarded. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, and and again, I closed the the first episode of the day, but just saying the same thing. Like voting is like not valuing your rights enough. Your yeah. government is dying for your support, your effort. Go out and yeah. volunteer. Go get involved. Go work for your congressperson. Go work for your senator. Go work for your town, your county, your, whatever it is. They need your – they are That's desperate for your help. And then you will work with people you don't agree with, and you will come to unanimous decisions on how you're going to attack a problem, and it will be incredible. So my last plug of the day is there's a yes. company, and I'm not officially involved in it yet, but I, I'm a big fan of uh, – my friend Zane has a company called I Constituent. And what they do is they are a CRM for elected representatives to communicate with their stakeholders. And when he pitched me this business, he was trying to get me to invest. And, and frankly, it's not in my investment thesis. But you know, like you pitch something and you keep thinking about it and coming back to it. And like, I can't think of a product that is more interesting based on what we see in the last 10 years. Oh. And so like, like not, you know, go support I guess you want to get your elected representatives to use it. But also, like, think about how you as a human being or as an individual or as a company or as any anyone can help build stronger, more effective feedback loops on cycles of change and, and, and cultural evolution, because that's really the important part is, is getting this feedback working better. Like I actually don't want people to agree with me all the time. I want them to disagree because it's more fun to talk to them, but I want us all to be able to agree to disagree and to respect each other's opinions and to learn and grow and not stay on the hillsides throwing rocks. Stand by for one second. We shut this thing down. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. And right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous up. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching.